Welcome to the webinar today. We are the Evidence Evaluation of Peer Programs. I'm Oryx Cohen, and I'm currently the Acting Exec Executive Director of the National Empowerment Center. And I just wanted to share before we got started that we were just awarded a, a five-year grant from SAMHSA to fund our Technical Assistance Center, which we're very excited about. And our focus area is crisis response services. And a big part of that is evaluating things like peer run respites and other alternative crisis response. Um, so it's uh, very timely that we're having this uh, webinar on evaluation. And first, a uh, little housekeeping. Um, you should have on your dialog box a question function and you can ask questions through there. Um, and the panelists will be taking questions at the end. Uh, there will not be time, I imagine, to answer all the questions, but each of the panelists have said that they would be willing to respond via email um, to any questions that, that aren't answered on this webinar. Um, there's also a chat function. You can use that as well. Um, and we may be sending you some messages from time to time through that, so you want to keep an eye out on the chat, the chat function. Um, just to let you know, this webinar is being recorded, and it will be available on our website, uh, www.powertoyou.org. And so we're very excited that uh, we have Jean Campbell, Leisha Ostro, and Bevan Croft to, pres to present today. Um, and I'm giving you a little bit of an introduction and housekeeping here. There's our website on this slide. I uh, did want to mention that um, not all of the slides will be covered today. So uh, we, we decided to present a lot of material um, because we know that this is uh, being recorded and will be archived and available. So we may be going quickly through some of the slides, but they will be available uh, for, for your review later. Um, and at this point, without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce our first panelist, who is Jean Campbell. And in 2014, Dr. Campbell retired as a research professor in mental health at the Missouri Institute of Mental Health, University of Missouri, St. Louis. As a mental health consumer, researcher, speaker, mentor, and director of the university's program in consumer studies and training, Dr. Campbell advanced the understanding of consumer issues and challenged the use of coercion in the delivery of mental health services. She helped establish peer-run programs as an evidence-based practice to promote a recovery-based mental health system, eventually becoming a principal investigator of the largest, most rigorous study of peer-run programs. So, Jean, why don't you take it over? Thank you. As an introduction, hello everybody. As an introduction uh, to this webinar, I would like to share with you a short story of consumer evaluation. I begin with a quote, research and evaluation ought to and can enhance consumer choice, power, and knowledge. That was written by one of my uh, colleagues, a consumer researcher, Jean Dumont, when she was a member of the Mental Health Consumer Survivor Ex-Patient Research and Policy Workgroup, which we'll meet in another slide uh, in 1992. And that really became our anthem as uh, evaluators and researchers over the past almost three decades. We say we are the evidence. What does that mean? Well, for one thing, uh, we have experienced recovery and the negative consequences of uh, coercion as a movement. But we are also the embodiment 
of our lived experience. Slide. Next slide. Next slide. I am both scientist and artist. Next slide. And I have also experienced madness besides being a grandmother and gardener living on the uh, outer reaches of the Mojave Desert. In 1987, next slide, my worlds collided when I was hired by the California Network of mental health clients to co-direct with Ron Schraber the Wellbeing Project. The result was the first consumer research project in history and the beginning of our journey as peers to come to voice through research and evaluation. It was also my personal journey coming out as a mental health consumer to fight for social justice using social science to augment our voice in the consumer survivor movement. Next slide. Next slide. Thank you. No, go back. One of the most important things I found over the years that I began to learn in those early days was the types of questions you ask lead to the types of answers you get. If you ask questions about recovery, you produce knowledge about recovery. If you ask questions about the negative aspects of uh, traditional mental health services, then you get those negative aspects. So the types of questions you ask lead to the types of answers you get. As individuals, each one of us, as a community of consumers, as evaluators, Evaluation is personal, social, as well as scientific. Next slide. We learned in the civil rights movement that when a disempowered group begins to come to voice, there is a collision of values and action. Biomedical research, which to this day defines the status quo in mental health traditional uh, service system, ignores meaningful human aspects that encompass personal and social needs. And all of the factors that differentiate people from symptoms, brains, or molecules. From the perspective and that word is very important. From the perspective of mental health professionals, mental illness refers to pathology. The types of questions they ask are those related to pathology. Researchers monitor functionality, recidivism, and symptom control. That's what they ask questions about. Providers tend to look at the way the results of services affect the mental health system and usually they don't look at the negative consequences of the service delivery system, only those things they consider positive. Next slide. Next slide, please. In a review of the literature, Priscilla Ridgway, who is also a consumer survivor researcher, found that there were wide differences between consumers and professionals on the relative importance of treatment goals, identification of problems, barriers to service, and needs and preferences for housing and supports. Participation of consumers in defining and measuring psychiatric services has over the years precipitated a kind of turf war over controlling human beings in a landscape that includes an entire array of service option and widely divergent goals and definitions of mental health and quality of life. And that's basically a, a quote from an early article on uh, well-being consumer researchers. 
Next slide. Oh, there we are. In 1987, a groundbreaking survey called the Wellbeing Project was conducted by the California Network of Mental Health Clients under contract to the Office of Prevention of the California Department of Mental Health. In an exploration of what factors promote or deter the well-being of those commonly labeled as mentally ill, over 500 mental health clients, family members of mental health clients, and we called them clients in California at that time, and mental health professionals and care group givers from throughout California shared their time, perceptions, and histories by answering many pages of questions and providing over 40 hours of recorded testimony. Next slide. It was the Wellbeing Project was written, administered, and analyzed entirely by mental health consumers. Next question, I mean, next slide. Before focus groups and concept mapping and standardized protocols, we began the project by bringing together mental health clients. And we sat in this old house on this floor, there must have been like 25 of us, and started to tell stories about what promoted and deterred our well-being as mental health consumers in the, in the traditional mental health system. And as we did that, we filled out these colored three by five cards and piled them in the center. And throughout the next three hours, that pile grew higher and higher. It was a real tower of empowerment. And from that was how we developed, how we developed the questions. Next slide. The project was unique because the study and the subsequent development of educational materials were also created by mental health consumers themselves. We focused on the health and wellness of individuals, and remember this is 1987, rather than any imputed disability. It was assumed from the beginning that well-being is a positive, empowering, life-affirming process. What individuals perceived as their reality, their feelings, and their possibilities emerged in a set of statistical findings related to the quality of their lived experiences. Next slide. It was found that fundamental to the well-being of mental health consumers is the sense of personhood, individuality, and human dignity. More than half of the clients interviewed felt that they'd been discriminated against because of psychiatric labeling. A third indicated that people treated them like they were incapable of holding a job. And almost three quarters of the client surveyed said that meaningful work or achievement is essential to their well being, although almost half stated they lacked meaningful work or achievement in their everyday lives. Almost half felt lonely or isolated from other people all the time or many times, while nearly 70% believed a satisfying social life is essential for well being. 28% said they lacked basic human freedoms in their everyday lives, and to almost a quarter reported that they lacked good food or a decent place to live. Next slide. As mental health clients, the Wellbeing Project affirmed our personhood in a world of stigma, poverty, loneliness, and injustice. Our voices illuminate the value of self-help, creativity, meaningful work, basic human dignity and respect, and most importantly, we spoke for ourselves. Next slide. <laughs> 
from that uh, beginning uh, emerged a peer research and evaluation model. And I think that um, all of you that are initiating evaluation should check your process to this model. Not that you have to follow everything, but it helps to know what some of the found, founding principles are, including research is organized from the bottom up, the consumer perspective is sought and respected, and that all participants are seen as study partners, issues of ownership and control are confronted. The evaluation story, as I'm doing that today, is told. Personal impact is captured, both in um, shared stories as well as in open-ended questions and uh, the act of peer participation. And knowledge exchange is the key goal. Next slide. Next slide. So the goal of recovery and empowerment and many of the things that we think are important and know that are important to our lives uh, as mental health consumers are rooted in the rich history of the mental health consumer survivor ex-patient movement and the development of organized peer supports. Those tend to go hand in hand, but we have to claim ownership of those concepts. If you think back, that's why I spent the time talking about the well-being project, is we've, we've been carrying that banner for uh, almost 30 years. Next slide. By the 1990s, persons with mental illness began to formally organize on a national level with the nothing about us, with without us, and uh, that also was true for those interested in research and evaluation. So peer advocates, providers, and researchers formed the Consumer Survivor X Patient Research and Policy Work Group from federal support from the Center for Mental Health Services, and that helped not only the um, peer-run support groups to mature and diversify and increase in numbers, but also the evaluation of those, those programs and the development of uh, tools that were really focused on, um, as consumers, what we thought were the fundamentals of evaluation. So by the 21st century, um, the push for recovery and the demand for accountability through measurement of outcomes and program satisfaction has accelerated across the United States. Next slide. And during that time, from the 1990s on, uh, we have been initiating our own studies. And I didn't put on a slide, but uh, I also remember besides our, our efforts to do research, uh, we had summer institutes uh, two years in a row supported uh, by both SAMHSA and uh, the West Virginia Consumer Network, summer institutes on evaluation where each time we trained over 70 people uh, over a four day period about uh, evaluation and research. We identify the needs and preferences for housing and supports. We profiled state mental health systems. We developed measurement tools, satisfaction, empowerment, well-being, healing. We introduced consumer satisfaction teams and promoted the use of focus groups. Next slide. We had a series of focus groups uh, that was supported early on uh, uh, from the Consumer Survivor Mental Health uh, Research and Policy Work Group that did this thing called concept mapping. Next slide. To, uh, to find out uh, what were the most frequently identified concerns from mental health consumers. And we found at that point that they were uh, 
threats of involuntary treatment, subtle forms of coercion, lack of respect, debilitating side effects of psychotropic medications, and also recovery, personhood, well-being, and liberty were also defined as valued outcomes. And building on these preliminary studies, uh, the federal government encouraged states to implement the value-based consumer-oriented mental health statistics improvement report card, which didn't include the concept of recovery for almost uh, 10 years after the first um, the, fir the first report cards were initiated, and there was a big struggle over actually getting the concept of recovery into the consumer-oriented report card. Next slide. So to survive in this era of evidence-based funding, uh, peer providers realized that they needed to measure cost, effectiveness, quality, utilization, appropriateness of services they provided. And I feel that that's probably why a lot of you are on the call today. One of the tools that uh, were developed uh, in 1995 to the year 2000 is the POP, or the Peer Outcomes Protocol Project, which is which measures outcomes and modules. Next slide. Here they are, and there's a few of you that are either on the call or that I'm and that I'm working with that are using the POP right now. So here are some of the modules that were developed, and this was all developed by uh, consumers uh, with an oversight from. Uh, the Chicago um, Center for Disability, Judith Cook's Research uh, Center. Next slide. Also, I wanted to note and refer people to um, a qualitative um, effort of grounded research that began. This was the first effort in notice 2002 uh, that. Uh, really started to look at what recovery was and produced a series of publications uh, that I think are available through uh, NASHBID that, uh, and the performance indicators of recovery for mental health systems. And that's rapidly becoming a standard in the field for those interested in measuring recovery. Next slide. Now, to conclude, I'd like to spend a little time talking about the consumer operated services um, evidence based practice um, recognition of uh, our peer run projects as an evidence based practice. Uh, consumers and others in, in what we call the COSP, Consumer Operated Service Programs, multi site research initiative found that peer-run service programs were effective as an adjunct to traditional mental health services in improving the outcomes of adults diagnosed with serious mental illness. And um, those words are, are wordsmith quite carefully, as you must do uh, when you're doing a, uh, a very rigorous research project. Analysis of over 1,800 participants revealed that those that did offer uh, peer-run programs as an adjunct to their traditional mental health services showed significant gains in positive subjective well-being, which was defined in a subscale as hope, self-efficiency, or self-efficacy, empowerment, goal attainment, and meaning in life in comparison to, who were, to those who were offered traditional mental health services only. And as we said at the beginning, uh, the COST multi-site research initiative was the largest and most rigorous study of consumer operated services ever conducted. Next slide. You can see here, um, this is a, a slide showing our, our final outcomes 
over the um, the research project that everybody got a little bit of well-being. So the red line, which is those that also got the consumer operated services, is significantly higher. But even the traditional programs that participated but did not offer uh, peer run programs as an adjunct uh, still got some well being. Next slide. The greatest gains in well-being were found for participants who used the peer support services the most, and that could be in one time uh, into multiple times. Uh, variations in well-being effects across sites were unrelated to the model of peer support that they used, whether they were a drop-in center or a crisis hospice or a or a uh, mutual support group or a um, advocacy training type of a, of a um, group. Uh, it was the element of peer support. And from that uh, analysis, of, we found common ingredients. And we found a relationship of cor correlation between the common ingredients and the outcome re results that showed that uh, the key peer practices produce positive subjective well-being outcomes. Next slide. And you can see here by use how much the high use, the high use, the, the level of well-being. Next slide. So the uh, common ingredients which led to the development of the Fidelity Assessment Common Ingredients Tool, or the FACET, was developed and tested uh, to evaluate how effectively a peer-run program is implementing the evidence-based peer practices. It's one thing to show that a model peer-run program has positive outcomes and is evidence-based. It's another uh, to actually um, employ the evidence-based peer practices so you can be evidence-based. Uh, so we identified 46 common ingredients and established a significant link between the service elements of peer-run programs, which were their structures, values, and practices, and the positive psychological functioning of participants. And we came, we also identified like super food, we have the super common ingredients, one person told me, which were peer practices that seem to have the greatest effect on the production of well-being. And those were uh, telling one's story, creative self-expression, informal and formal peer support, knowledge of con the consumer movement, and a safe environment. And uh, the FACET, which is a fully has a fully developed uh, toolkit, both for uh, those peer-run programs that are done by telephone, warm lines, as well as different models of peer-run peer um, on-site services. Uh, we have a complete uh, protocol that's been developed, and the Missouri Department of Mental Fe Health has used that with two-person teams of certified FACET peer evaluators, and we've trained over 20 certified FACET peer evaluators in Ohio. Next. So, um we do have two other panelists. So, Jean, I was thinking this might be a good place to pause. Is is there um, anything you'd like to say in in closing your piece, and then maybe we can get to some more of this in the question and question and answers. Thank you, Thank you. I think I covered it all. I just had a, a rousing. Um, conclusion and some references and uh, some other tools for people, but I'm happy. I don't want to hog the time. <laughs> and I'm interested in hearing what um, some of the new projects are doing. 
Okay, thank, thank you so much, Jean, uh, for that presentation. Um, we're going to go ahead and fast forward through the rest of these slides, which again are going to be available for you as an archive. And we're going to get to um, Leisha's presentation. And I'd like to introduce um, Leisha Ostro, uh, our next panelist. Leisha Ostro is a research associate in the University of Southern California's School of Social Work and the CEO of Live and Learn, Inc. Dr. Ostro's research over the past several years has focused on the role of peer support in social service systems. As part of her doctoral dissertation, she designed and conducted the 2012 National Survey of Mental Health peer-run organizations. Dr. Ostro has served on federal work groups to promote the voice of peers in policy and research and provided technical assistance and consulting services on implementation of peer respites in several states. So now we're going to be providing some examples of some more research in action and some current research. So I'll turn it over to Leisha. Thank you, Oryx, and uh, thanks everybody for being here and participating. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, peer respites, which are a particular subset of peer-run organizations or uh, consumer-operated services, um, as Jean referred to them. Um, next slide. So uh, last year, Bevan and I uh, conducted, in partnership with NEC, a survey of the peer respites in the U.S. Um, just to gather some information on program level characteristics, Bevan is going to be talking specifically about um, service user outcomes from the second story respite. So these data are about the um, peer respite at the program level. And I will talk a little bit about that survey and the research base to date on peer respites, which is actually not that substantial, but we're working towards it. And I'd hope to highlight throughout issues for all of you to think about in designing peer respites, implementing them, and then evaluating them, hopefully. Next slide. Next slide. So these are the peer respites as of uh, last fall that I said that were included in the survey. We recruited all of those, we attempted to recruit all of those that are listed on NEC's peer respite webpage, which you should definitely check out if you haven't already. Um, so you can see here the distribution, the, the most darkly shaded uh, states are the ones that have um, three peer respites. So there's no more at this, no more states at this time that have more than three. And, um, a lot of them have only one, but this number, I've been working with NEC and others since 2009, and the number has been growing steadily and substantially. Next slide. So, as I'm sure most of you are aware, but in case you're not, um, inpatient and emergency services utilization is the driver of a lot of unnecessary mental health system spending. Uh, in addition to that, Perhaps more importantly, there's a human cost to emergency and inpatient services, including iatrogenic harm to service users, life disruption for service users and their families, and um, a dependence on the mental health system rather than independence, which is one of the goals of peer support, not independence from one another, but independence from the system. So peer respites were created with the idea that more humane, trauma-sensitive, and less coercive supports could be available and divert both of these costs. Next slide. Next. Um, so what are peer respites? These are voluntary short-term residential programs designed to support individuals experiencing or at risk of experiencing a mental health crisis. They're intended to build supportive connections between people with lived experience and avert the need for psychiatric emergency services. Some of the programs that we've seen them implemented across the country are really more focused on, um, on preventing people from spiraling into a crisis which might end them in the hospital or the emergency room. Um, if you've ever experienced a psychiatric crisis, I have, it often starts before there's any need for um, that kind of heavy-handed intervention. So uh, the goal of a lot of the peer respites is to work with people 
to um, avoid those crises, which are not just unpleasant because of emergency service utilization, but can often just be unpleasant um, for the folks experiencing them. So peer respites are staffed and operated by people with lived experience in the mental health system who also have professional training and crisis support. And they seek to build mutual and trusting relationships. Next slide. So there's a lot of different organizational structures for both um, peer-run organizations and peer-to-peer -peer programs, as well as peer respite specifically. We've been working over the years to define these in terms of the involvement of people with lived experience um, on staff or volunteers, as well as in management and leadership positions. So peer run indicates that the board of directors of the organization is at least 51% people with lived experience. And um, people with lived experience also staff operate and oversee the respite at all levels. Peer operated indicates that although the board may not be a majority of people with lived experience, the director of the program and the people who work there are people with lived experience. These are often, or perhaps sometimes, attached to the traditional provider. Devin's going to talk about second story. That would fall into the peer-operated category. Um, mixed, or what we're kind of toying with calling peer-staffed, are embedded in a traditional provider, but have people with lived experience working there. Um, but people with lived experience don't need to be in leadership roles, either in program management or uh, organizational leadership. Next slide. So I get a lot of questions, usually from people running mixed or purely traditional models about why this is even important uh, to classify organizations on the basis of involvement. Um, so based on existing research, um, who is involved, that is, whether and to what degree people with lived experience are involved in uh, program management and staffing may have an impact on services or outcomes. Um, this may be really important because the values of mutuality and equality in peer support, which is important throughout all types of peer support, may be even more important when people are experiencing a crisis and uh, may be particularly vulnerable to power and hierarchy dynamics that can be harmful. But the structures and processes of peer respite need to be studied um, along with the outcomes of the guest. So, um, Jean had talked a little bit about fidelity measurement using the facet. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more later. Um, you know, this helps us understand what are the best practices if we can measure what people are actually doing in programs. There may be no meaningful difference based on whether people identify as, um, as someone who has lived experience of the psychiatric system, um, but we don't really know that yet. So to date, that's kind of the best classification that we have. Next slide. So these are data from the survey that we conducted of the respites. Um, so on average, they have 3.6 or you know, three and a half people working there full time. Um, a bit more, 5.71 part time staff. Um, about three volunteers on average. Uh, most of them have two staff per shift on the weekdays. Um, it's a little bit less on the weekends, um, and then uh, less than that, a little over one staff per shift um, overnight. And there were two programs that also employ staff who do not identify as someone with lived experience, um, but overall most of them entirely ha were staffed um, by people uh, who've had those experiences. But as you can see, the numbers in the right column, uh, there's a big range um, in how these programs are staffed. Next slide. So um, who can go there? This refers to the service users or guests, as they're commonly called in peer respites. The peer respites take kind of a harm reduction approach, um, or I would hope that they would. So you know, there's obviously a lot of people in crisis um, experiencing a lot of negative outcomes or negative experiences in the system, as, as Jean talked about a little bit. I don't think that one small house in one community can change everything, um, but it's important, I think, to think of this as a harm reduction approach. That is, um, if we can help some people some of the time avoid negative outcomes and experiences, that's really better than nothing. So uh, we asked the respites in the survey whether um, they had restrictions related to people experiencing 
suicidality and people um, experiencing homelessness. So 40%, 47% of the programs did not have a restriction related to um, suicidal thoughts and feelings. And 41% had no restriction related to housing status. The housing status thing is important because um, we have a huge homelessness problem in this country nearly everywhere. Um, and short-term uh, homelessness shelters are not effective by any stretch of the imagination. And you know we want to avoid having something that really has the mission of serving people who are experiencing a mental health or psychiatric crisis or in an extreme state um, and not get distracted by trying to provide housing for folks, which is really important as a goal in itself. Um, and we don't need to create these kind of programs to uh, for people who are experiencing homelessness, we need to create homelessness programs for that. Next slide. So um, this is the number of how many guests are at the respite at any one time. So on average, um, these programs can accommodate four people at a time, um, staying for an average of about six days with a maximum length of stay of nine days. Um, we asked them about um, how often the program is filled. It's 51, the average census was 51%. So that means the programs are empty almost half of the time. This has huge implications for cost calculations, should you want to do them, which I think is important when we're making the argument that peer respites are saving service systems and funders money. Um, if they're only half full a lot of the time, then um, they actually are costing more than what we calculated the cost per day. So it's really important to do outreach to communities um, to make sure that the programs are actually being used. Um, you know, there's sort of no point in having it if no one's there. Um, you know, we want to be fulfilling the mission um, at a lower cost because that's the argument that's going to win with policymakers. Next slide. I'm going to talk a little bit about the money that the peer respites are operating on. Next slide. So. Four of the peer respites had a budget of over $500,000 a year. It's an operating budget, not a startup budget. Um, but there was a, a pretty big range in uh, how much funding they were using to operate per year. Next slide. The uh, most frequent source of uh, funding was from state revenues or block grants uh, with 14 of the 17 programs receiving state revenues and block grants, a little bit less than that, eight programs getting county or local money, um, four getting money from SAMHSA, and then one getting private foundation or private donation. Next slide. We did the best we could to estimate how much money per funder is going into these programs. So there's almost $4 million coming from state revenues, uh, one and a half from county or local agencies, and then way less than that. So um, even though a number of programs are getting money from SAMHSA, it's actually a relatively small amount of money, and it's really the states that are supporting these programs. Next slide. Uh, so there's a little bit of research, um, and we're building more. There's been one randomized control trial that's the gold standard of research. Um, that was conducted in 2008, um, and they showed greater satisfaction for those who used the respite versus those who were in um, inpatient care. The second story evaluation, Devin's going to discuss those results. I think that's the best research on peer respite that we have to date. Peer support in general has a moderate evidence base as shown by reviews of the literature, as does acute residential crisis programs also have a moderate evidence base and so, you know sort of peer respites are kind of at the intersection of those two lines of research. Next slide. So this gets back to the issue of how important or in what ways is it important that people with lived experience be involved in leadership um, and staff positions in these programs. Previous research on, on peer and organizations in general, not peer respites, found that those um, that had more lateral and participatory democratic structures had improvements for service users or members in outcomes uh, of empowerment and stigma reduction over those that were more hierarchical. I think a lot of us could say that's based on intuition, but it's really important to have good data on that. 
Um, there's also been some research that the degree of involvement by people with lived experience in peer-run organizations has shown that those organizations that have uh, more people with lived experience in operational control are more likely to engage in the strategies that lead to the outcomes um, of the previous bullet. So there's there are potentially better outcomes for organizations that have more involvement by people with lived experience. Next slide. So what's next for practice? Um, I think it's really important to be clear on what it is that the, the program does and who they serve. So clarifying eligibility career criteria on homelessness, suicidality, um, also working on the issue of uh, having a full census, having the program be full as much of the time as possible, which might be done through shorter stays. Um, I think one important thing about this is that none, no two programs are really going to be the same. There's a lot of factors that go into how a program runs and why it has the policies that it does. And I think all of us that are working in mental health understand that there's a lot of individual circumstances that go into decisions, um, you know, clarifying policies to be as uniform as possible, to be fair to people who are wanting to stay there, um, you know, and just being clear about what it is that the program actually does and who they serve. So this goes with aligning the program operations with the mission. Um, you know, what is the organizational structure? Why is it that way in a particular community? What might be the best fit for that community? Uh, we're all hearing a lot about Medicaid reimbursement of peer support. Um, there's some problems and some opportunities there, which I don't have time to get into now. Um, and then the relationship with the traditional mental health system and, you know, sort of add to that also other um, parts of the community, uh, you know, and how everybody is working together to build stronger supports for people experiencing a crisis. Next slide. So Jean had briefly reviewed the FACET, uh, which is the fidelity measure for peer-run organizations. We are attempting to adapt this for peer respite in particular, which has some differences from uh, peer-run organizations in general. Um, we'll be including in that measurement of the organizational structure, as we've already talked about, um, and then the actual qualities of the program, rather than just relying on these blunt categories of, you know, how many people with lived experience are involved or not. Um, and some adaptations really to the short-term overnight nature of these programs. Um, we need funding for that, so if you'd like to make a donation to NEC, that would be helpful. We're also trying to develop more robust measures of intentional peer support, which are, uh, which is a peer support training and practice that's most commonly used in peer respite um, and getting at whether people are practicing IPF with some degree of fidelity that would lead to uh, better service user and community outcomes. And we will be repeating and updating the survey that results that I talked about um, this fall. So if you have suggestions on questions that you would have about peer respite at the program level, I would be happy to receive those by email and uh, consider them for inclusion this fall in our next survey. Next slide. Ah. So um, there's a toolkit that Bevan and I wrote in partnership with NEC and with the directors of some of the respite on evaluating peer respite. The data that I presented here are there, as well as strategies that are being used by peer respite um, to evaluate their programs. Uh, Bevan and I also published an article earlier this year that has kind of an overview of um, our views on what needs to be done in program implementation and evaluation, and that's free at that link. So please contact me with any questions. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Leisha. I also wanted to mention that um, you can also find that toolkit for evaluating peer respites on our website, which is listed on one of the first slides, and you'll be getting that, all the slides as an archive. So, and I just want, wanted to remind people that at the end, after this last presentation, it looks like we'll have a good chunk of time to address your questions, which is probably the most important part of this presentation. So there is a questions function, and um, please please use that on your dialog box to ask ask questions, and we'll be taking those at the end. So right now, I'd like to introduce um, our next panelist, which is Bevan Croft. <laughs> 
Bevan Croft works with the Human Services Research Institute and has over 10 years experience with behavioral health services provision, management, quality improvement, workforce development, and research. Ms. Croft is the project director of an evaluation of the Second Story Peer and Respite program in Santa Cruz, California, and she's going to talk about that. So welcome, Bevan. Uh, thanks, Max. Um, so um, I'm happy to uh, say that I've been the project director of the evaluation of um, the Santa Cruz Peer Respite since it opened in 2011. Um, so I'll be talking about that today. Next slide, please. So what I hope to go through today as quickly as I can um, is describing the evaluation itself and our approach to the evaluation. Um, and then uh, to present some of our findings. Uh, and finally, to discuss what, um, what I see and what Leisha and I see as next steps for research in peer respite. And Leisha already started to talk about that. I'll kind of extend that discussion a little further. Next slide, please. Uh, just a little bit more background about Second Story. Uh, as Leisha mentioned, uh, this would fall under the peer-operated uh, organizational model for a respite. Um, the program is staffed, and um, and also the leadership of the program uh, all have lived experience um, as peers, but the program itself is sort of housed under a traditional community-based organization, a large organization, human services organization in Santa Cruz County called Encompass. Uh, the program was initially funded by a mental health transformation grant from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration and overseen by the county. Um, and uh, beginning this year, the county um, behavioral health department is going to pick up support for the program, in part because of some of the positive research results that have come out of this evaluation. Um, this particular program offers uh, support for six people at a time, um, and people can stay for up to 14 days. And the primary modality that's used is intentional peer support. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with IPS, it's a trauma-informed service delivery paradigm that really emphasizes mutuality and relationships, uh, reciprocity, uh, and, and growth. Next slide. The evaluation um, was pretty broad-ranging um, and had two main components. The first is an outcome evaluation that really sought to understand whether the program met the objectives that were outlined in the original grant application for SAMHSA. And those were to reduce, reduce inpatient and emergency hospitalizations, thereby reducing uh, costs to the system, uh, while also fostering uh, recovery or well-being for guests. And that's the term that's used to describe the people who come to stay, stay at Second Story. Um, and also to increase meaningful choices in Santa Cruz County um, for people to, um, to get support for their wellness and recovery. We also concurrently conducted a process evaluation that was really looking into the black box of how the program works. Um, we we're interested in how the program was implemented and also the relationship between the program and the community. And by community, I mean the traditional behavioral health system that it sort of uh, worked with um, and was embedded in but also the community at large, the public community. Um, and the goal of all of that is to really compile lessons learned for other peer respites and for future peer respites moving forward. Next slide. Just a little bit about um, sort of our approach to provide for its evaluation. Um, in this particular uh, effort, we really saw relationships as being key and worked uh, very diligently to be as participatory as possible throughout the process, really acknowledging that we were partners um, in this um, in this effort, and um, and that our job was to really gather gather data and useful information for the folks operating the program and then for the for um, the funders. Um, so a lot of the work involved establishing relationships with an evaluation team on the ground. Um, so that involved um, Frequent contact, regular calls um, with the evaluation team. I'm based in the Boston area, uh, so if site visits out to Santa Cruz were really critical for establishing relationships. It doesn't hurt that Santa Cruz is a lovely place to go and visit, so I've enjoyed that uh, immensely 
Um, we worked hard to be flexible and responsive to the needs of the program and to be f as formative as possible, meaning to um, feed that information as quickly as we could. Um, we did quarterly reports, ad hoc meetings, and when um, people on the staff team had questions, we really worked to, um, to address those on an ongoing basis. Um, and we also worked to involve um, the folks at the program as much as we could in our analysis and also in the dissemination of the findings. Next slide, please. Quickly, this is a list of the different types of data sources that we use for the evaluation. The ones that are in gray are the ones that I'm going to speak uh, more in depth about, but this gives you a sense of how broad we cast our net in terms of what we were looking at. Next slide. Um, and briefly, I just want to mention, Leisha mentioned the um, importance of, of charting fidelity and one sort of side project that came out of this evaluation was uh, beginning to develop a set of core competencies, really a measure, um, to gauge uh, whether or not people were practicing intention, the practice of intentional peer support with fidelity. So this is just a little mini condensed version of a scale that we developed called the RTS Core Competencies. We developed it in partnership with Sharon Mead and others uh, up in Vermont. Um, there's a much more detailed scale, but I put this uh, condensed version on the slide. Um, and it's designed for flexible use um, uh, to, to understand uh, whether IPS is being practiced. Um, it's very much in the developmental stages. Um, and if anyone's interested in learning more about that, you have my contact information. I'd be happy to talk with you about that. Our next slide. Getting on to some of the results. First, we'll talk about what we found in the county service utilization data. So these are the data that are already routinely collected by the county behavioral health department. Um, we looked at uh, information on 139 people who used Second Story in the first two years of the program, and we compared that information to, um, to information on a group of people with similar characteristics who hadn't used the peer respite services. So in other words, we, um, we used a process, uh, a statistical method called propensity score matching, uh, to establish a comparison group of people who didn't use the respite but were similar along clinical, demographic, service use history um, lines to the people who did. And the idea is um, we're comparing similar groups that allow us to draw conclusions about second story's effect. And the outcome that we looked at for this analysis was inpatient and emergency service use. So that includes crisis support, residential, and then inpatient hospital as well, and emergency ones. Next slide. So those, of those 139 people that we looked at, um, guests stayed um, multiple times on average. So we saw that people came back to use the respite multiple times. And that's something that we, was very clear in this evaluation. People, um, most people use the respite more than once. Um, total respite days were about 28 uh, days. Um, the majority of the folks who used the respite were non-Hispanic white, single, unemployed and had a care coordinator, which is like a case manager. Um, and most of them had already had used inpatient emergency services prior to coming to respite. Next slide. So the, uh, our analysis had two phases. But at first, we just looked at um, the likelihood of using inpatient or emergency services after using respite for the two groups. Um, and we found that the people who used the respite were 70% less likely to use inpatient and emergency services than the people who didn't. And that was a statistically significant difference. So that's a difference that you wouldn't see just by chance alone. Um, and then we, for people who did use inpatient and emergency services after using respite, and there were about 100 people in the sample who ended up going to inpatient or emergency services, um, the ones who used the respite used less. They use fewer hours of inpatient emergency services than the people who didn't use the respite. So on average, we're seeing people are, uh, after using the respite, people are less likely to use those uh, iatrogenic uh, inpatient emergency services. And when they did, they didn't use as many. Um, so that was pretty positive. Um, a close look at the results, I'll just mention, um, suggests a little more complex of a relationship. Um, for folks who use the respite, for longer periods of time, we saw diminishing returns. So we saw that there were some folks who used the respite for longer periods of time, 
who also use inpatient and emergency services for longer periods and were more likely to use those services. And we think that there may have been some unobserved factors that were at play there that we just weren't able to pick up for this particular analysis. So for this analysis, we were able to look at things like um, housing stability, social supports, a lot of other um, very important things um, that may have had an impact on this relationship for the rest of the inpatient emergency service use. Next slide, please. So now I'll move on to some of the results of the interviews and surveys that we did that get at um, some other outcomes that we all know to be important. Um, so for stakeholder interviews, we conducted a whole lot of interviews uh, with a lot of different kinds of stakeholders. Um, the results I'll focus on now are mainly with the guests. Um, we did 23 interviews, in-depth interviews with 19 guests. So some folks were interviewed more than once over the four-year period. Um, and we oversampled people who were younger and new to the system, um, those who used high levels of inpatient and emergency services, and those who were dissatisfied with the program, um, just because we wanted to get a, as well-rounded a picture as possible and not just, um, you know, raw, raw, uh, happy customers. Um, we also conducted interviews with providers, a lot of interviews with the staff team. And those interviews were recorded and transcribed and, and um, analyzed um, using qualitative uh, analytic methods. Next slide. We also conducted guest surveys. We worked with an excellent team of data collectors um, who were people with lived experience in Santa Cruz who were specially trained to be a part of the evaluation team. And they met with folks um, uh, within 24 hours of um, coming to the program, and then within two days of being of leaving the program, and then six months after staying at the program, um, to uh, do a survey um, for, for folks who consented. It was an optional survey, of course. A um, couple of issues I just want to flag that came up um, when we did the surveys that are just important to remember for the future. Um, one was that the survey was very long. We wanted to know a lot. Um, and for, for some guests, it really posed a, a burden on their, on their time. Um, so in retrospect, I think we would have probably made the survey that we used shorter. Um, another piece was that ethics and confidentiality are were sort of different um, in this program. The peer respite environment is open, it's home-like, there isn't a lab, there isn't an, a, a private interview room available. So the peer data collectors really had to work with individual guests to negotiate what they were comfortable with in terms of when and how to take the survey. Um, losing people to follow up was a challenge. It is often is in studies like this. Um, it was hard to stay in touch with people for six months out. Definitely a challenge. Um, another challenge was um, just recruiting and retaining those, those data collectors. It was a tricky job because it was only part time but required a lot of flexibility and hours. And a lot of the folks who were data collectors ended up uh, also working at the, at the house as staff which posed a conflict of interest for us because we didn't want the guests to feel like they needed to um, respond in a certain way to the questions, um, particularly the questions about program experience. We wanted them to be open and honest. So we had to develop a, a very careful protocol um, to make sure that people who, um, who worked there as staff were seen as staff and the data collectors were seen as, as separate and not staff. Next slide. Um, so I'd like to spend a little more time just going over some of the preliminary results of those interviews and surveys, which were, I think, quite interesting. Um, on the left column is a, uh, some themes that came out of the interviews. Um, and on the right column are some areas of focus of the surveys. Um, so I'll dive into the results and sort of explain what I'm presenting as I go. I'm not going to be able to go through all of the next slides in detail, but as Oryx said, these slides will be available to you. Um, as an archive, and also I'm happy to um, talk or answer any questions you may have offline um, about these results. Next slide. So um, the survey results and the interview results are kind of going to be presented here side by side. The results in these um, arrows, these gray arrows, represent statistically significant improvements in the ratings of various survey items comparing the person's first baseline response, so their response basically before they experienced the respite at all, um, to their last discharge interview. 
And for folks who came back to the program multiple times, this would be the last interview of the last day. So the most recent time we talked to them. And the percentages that are listed here represent the number of people whose responses improved from that first interview to the last. For example, 83% of respite guests had a stronger level of agreement with the statement, I feel I belong in my community after second story compared to before. And for each of these uh, little arrows, we performed a test of statistical significance to determine that the changes were large enough to be not attributable to chance alone. So in other words, there was a significant change in these areas for people um, after second story. And then the slide titles and the stuff in italics are quotes from the interviews. Um, they were um, sentiments that were expressed across multiple interviews. Um, and one of our clearest findings was that people who saved the respite really um, endorsed the idea that they were connecting to a community that they hadn't been connected to before. So folks described Second Story as a support network, uh, a community-based, communal, comfortable, continuous commune. Um, and one person said, I'd say it gave you a sense of identity. It gave you a sense of belonging. It showed me that there are people whose minds work the way my mind does, who are in control of their minds. Don't let their minds control them. Who are hugely intelligent and really run their own lives. Um, so that's just one example. On the next slide, a number of folks talked about uh, taking a rest. So thinking of respite and sense of rest, uh, how people saw Second Story as a safe place, uh, as a place to get support. Uh, next slide. Uh, people talked about self-determining their own program experiences. Uh, next slide. Uh, relationships were really a key component of this, um, developing relationships both with the staff themselves and with uh, other guests. And really uh, sort of meaningful relationships beyond like a service relationship, um, but actual friendships. Um, and we saw that reflected in the survey results as well, people feeling that they just had more of a social support um, in the event of a crisis in the future. Um, and Oryx, you can keep skipping through. Like I said, these slides will be available to you, and um, please feel free to read them um, on your own. Um, one more slide. And one more. A couple more. Let's go to some of the results. There we go. Okay. So summing up, um, we did observe in the survey data and the interview data statistically significant improvements in quality of life, wellness, hope, a whole range of uh, outcomes that we know are valued and important um, for respite guests. And then in the, on the quantitative side, we saw that respite use is significantly associated with a reduction in inpatient emergency services, but the picture is complicated. Uh, next slide. Just to wrap up, um, a few ideas about future uh, research. For us, um, we're going to be turning next to the process evaluation and to, again, as I said, really compile the list of lessons learned. Um, this question of what's the ideal organizational structure I think is really critical. Um, and it's something that the folks at Second Story wrestled with. And hopefully we can learn from some of what they wrestled with. And we're working on sort of compiling that information and making it available to all of you. Um, as we continue on with the analysis of the data that we have, um, we're going to be looking more closely at what characteristics are predictive of these uh, positive outcomes um, in terms of wellness recovery and also inpatient emergency service use reduction. Uh, we'll try to link the surveys and the service utilization data a little better, see if we can get at some of those hidden characteristics that I mentioned in the service use analysis. Um, and then we're also interested in the impact of the program on the lives of the staff which was something that came up a lot. Um, this program opened up a lot of jobs uh, for people with lived experience that weren't there before and has really um, proven to be a source of community, not just for the people who use the program, but for the people who work there. Um, and then also what's the impact of the program on the mental health system and on the community as a whole. I think we have some preliminary evidence that the program is really um, changing, the, um, changing the minds of some of the providers and some of the uh, some other folks in the community who, um, who interface with the program, um, including neighbors, uh, emergency responders, uh, people at the parole offices, police, 
uh, fire department um, about um, about issues of, of mental health and wellness and and, um, and the community, um, perhaps espousing some more trauma informed thinking in all of these groups. Next slide. Finally, as Leisha and I um, talk about a lot, and, um, and as Leisha mentioned, um, we, we have a lot of ideas about next steps for peer respite research. Um, one is to um, be sure to be capturing outcomes that are um, important and valued by the community of folks who use these outcomes, which is you all, and Jean talked about this as well. Um, and really looking closely at that. Cost and service use is important, um, but a lot of other things are equally or more important. Uh, quality of life, um, social connections, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we believe that it's very important to employ a mix of research approaches. Quantitative research is the gold standard, and it's very important. Um, but also capturing stories, experiences, um, and doing so in a way that's participatory, that involves people with lived experience at every step of the way is critical. And finally, this fidelity issue, um, the FACET, the IPS core competencies, really understanding what are the critical ingredients that make these respites what they are. The programs can and should uh, vary and be unique based on the unique communities, but, um, but they should also be informed by best practices. Um, so generating that information is very important, especially since these programs are cropping up all over the country, um, as Lisa mentioned. So that's it for me. Um, I'm happy to talk more with you, and I um, hope, uh, hope that was helpful. Thank you, Bevan. Um, just to remind people, we did have more slides than we could cover for this session, um, and those but that was done on purpose so that you would have those available in the archive uh, and have more information. So right now we're getting to the question and answer period and we had a lot of questions come in. So I'm going to take those in the order that they came in. And again, if we don't get to all of them, uh, you can email us um, and we'll get back to you. We wanna be able to answer all your questions. So the first question for the group is, how is the nationwide trend toward peer certification affecting evaluation patterns? Uh, this is Lisa. I'll try and answer that. Um, sorry. I'm Hi. Uh, sorry about that technical problem. So I think the thing that's really important um, in terms of uh, certification of peer specialists and corresponding Medicaid reimbursement, the thing that has always been Im important in really any kind of research, but especially this, and um, you know, Bev and I have talked a lot about fidelity and uh, measuring, you know, what's actually going on, whether people are practicing intentional peer support or other forms of peer support with um, some consistency to best practices. Um, I think there's a real opportunity with Medicaid reimbursement and certification to professionalize peer supports in a way that makes them more like other services that are available, case management, therapy, things like that, um, which have their own evidence base. And we really need to be measuring what, documenting what it is that we mean when we say that someone is engaging in peer support or working as a peer specialist rather than just sort of broad classification that happens to be um, reimbursable in the medical care system. I would uh, also like to add that I think it's important uh, that we also have certified peer evaluators. Uh, I don't think we should set people up for failure who are peers and uh, there should be great effort taken to provide sufficient training as interviewers, uh, also training for observation, how to conduct a focus group, uh, privacy and confidentiality statements that uh, we should be as rigorous as possible. I, I learned that um, when I headed up the project in Missouri, uh, which is still ongoing, uh, administering the FACET. And we certified through examination all those that were on the peer evaluator teams. 
Yeah, and um, I just wanted to also comment on this question because um, there's a bill currently being proposed in Congress by uh, Representative Tim Murphy. And just for information only, um, if that bill does get passed, it's going to really professionalize um, what peer specialists look like and, and make it very medical and very clinical in terms of what peer specialists do. Um, so I just wanted to make people aware of that. Um, and let's get to some more questions. There's a question that maybe um, Jean could take the lead on. Um, is, is the cost, which is Consumer Operated Service Program, being used in program development now? I didn't know until um, this webinar that Laisha was using the facet and the toolkit is developed online from SAMHSA so it can be freely used. There, is, there hasn't been outside of people personally contacting me uh, how they're using the toolkit since we first um, published it and uh, did a little research um, in the early years, like right after the toolkit was published. So sorry, I can't answer that question. Hopefully it is. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think it is. Um, I know that um, in the work that I've done, we've we've definitely used. It's a great resource that's available online too. The all the information about um, consumer operated service programs and and just the fact that we're now considered evidence based is huge and can be used in um, you know ad advocacy work and systems change. So um, let's let's get another question. Uh, it's pretty pretty straightforward one. Is there a website to purchase the facet materials or um, just by email? How how should people um, get a hold of the facet materials? Perfect question because I was trying to interrupt you, but you had me muted there. Uh, this is Jean, and uh, right now you can get all those all the facet materials by contacting me, uh, and I can uh, send you out. It's quite a large uh, set of materials. It's broken up into the actual assessment. There's a, a data a data system uh, application to enter the data. Uh, but I just wanted to say I've been in uh, some discussion with Oryx about uh, a website we developed for the COSP and the FACET uh, at uh, the Missouri Institute of Mental Health before I left uh, and retired that um, has never been published and talking to NEC about seeing if we can get that published and then from NEC and uh, get that up online so people will have the resources both to the cost and to the facet. Yeah, um, and we definitely want to do that. So um, you, everybody can be looking for that information in the near future from our, our website as well. Um, it's, it's been great to collaborate with you, Jean. Um, okay, let's get to another question. Uh, it's a question on the housing restriction of peer respites in LA County. Both of our peer run respites prohibit the homeless, but often in crisis, these folks end up hospitalized because respite isn't an option, putting them in a more traumatic and restrictive environment and, of course, costing much more help. <laughs> he want he wants some uh, some advice on that. Uh, yeah, I guess it's a good question and definitely worth clarifying that um, 
In my opinion, the restriction should not be categorically excluding people who don't currently have a stable home, um, but rather avoiding uh, turning a peer arrested program into a housing program. So obviously, um, you know, people who have an unstable living situation are more likely to experience a crisis, um, and I don't know that it's that those folks should be excluded, but um, yeah, just worth being careful about what staying true to the program mission. Yeah, and this is Evan. Um, I, I, it's such a thorny issue, and there isn't, there isn't one solution. Um, unfortunately, um, what Lisa said about the rest of the program not being turned into a sort of de facto housing program is really important. Um, but there are some strategies. Um, for instance, in Santa Cruz. Um, the restriction is basically the person needs to have some sort of place to go after they leave the respite program. Um, and they've done some work um, and laid some groundwork collaborating with local um, shelters um, to sort of develop a partnership so that they can sort of hand off the person after they are, are through at the respite. I'm going about it that way. So that's maybe one example of a strategy um, that could be useful in this one. And I now live in Los Angeles, so um, whoever has a question, please feel free to contact me afterwards. All right, thanks, Leisha. Uh, um, next question is, what have been the key factors involved in the states where multiple peer respite services have been established? I think that's a question for Oryx. <laughs> uh, we maybe we can team up. Um, yeah, I think it helps. Um, definitely helps to have more of an established movement in the area, um, and so having you know established uh, peer-run organizations. Um, preferably statewide peer-run organizations. Um, it seems to be a starting point for peer respites to uh, be developed. There's um, several, I think there's five now in Georgia, and they have the um, Georgia Consumer Network in, in Georgia that's been active for several years. Um, and in New York, New York is another uh, area that comes to mind um, where basically all of this started um, in, in New York State. And again, there's there's a lot of uh, peer run organizations that have been established there as well. Um, and I would say that uh, developing a relationship with your state agency is key because as you saw on the slides most of these are being funded through the state um, and if you can get get in good with your state agency and, and have them support this then oftentimes that can last for can be a long term thing um, any other thoughts on on why certain states have yeah. more I mean, I, I agree on having a strong uh, consumer survivor movement and peer run organizations. Um, it also sort of depends. Like, think about New Jersey. They got, uh, I believe they got reinvestment money for three respites. But that they also had a really strong statewide consumer network. Um, Wisconsin, um, I think the strategy, as I understand it, was to partner with um, folks from NAMI and, and, you know, kind of people sort of peripherally outside the consumer survivor movement. So I think it really depends on what the context is in the state, where the money's available, what partners you need, um, and, you know, building those strong alliances, um, as well as what the state is always said. Yeah. In Wisconsin, it was led by uh, Grassroots Empowerment Project, which is the statewide consumer network. Yeah. And those other, yeah. those are, NAMI and the other organizations, um, came along for the ride, but it was led by 
um, grassroots empowerment. Um, how about let's do another question. What can we do about family members and caregivers calling themselves peers and legislation aiming to certify peers as considering them as having lived experience? This is happening in California. I didn't know that was happening in California, so that's good to hear, to know. Um, so I think the, um, the International Association of Peer Specialists, they came up with a definition of a quote-unquote peer a couple of years ago that I thought was really good and, um, you know, not necessarily focused on diagnosis, but on um, adverse experiences in society and the system due to psychiatric labeling. Um, and, you know, disability and all of that. So um, I think that's a really good definition to refer to when you're talking to your legislators or state agencies about really being narrow in terms of defining someone who is, could be a peer specialist. Um, and again, it sort of depends on the local context. But I would refer to that. Does anybody else want to comment on that one? Um, it seems like it's happening more and more where uh, people are trying to qualify as peers, you know, basically chase chase funding. Um. <laughs> well, also, I think it moderates our voice and um, our goals, and it shows how recalcitrant um, the biomedical model and uh, the traditional treatment system are, regardless of uh, the language of recovery and uh, and support. So I think that um, we all have to push back, but I think on the other hand, uh, we need to find ways in which family members and policymakers so you uh, can participate. And going back to the Wellbeing Project years ago, we had a survey for family members, we had one for providers, and we had one for clients, so that all were involved in the project. Uh, so I think clearly defined roles, having roles for people uh, that validate them regardless of what their perspective is, is important, but we need to guard our own peer values. I think that's well said. Um, let's let's see if we can get to another question here. Uh, this is a peer specialist working in the District of Columbia. Um, grateful for the information. Um, looks like they're just sharing some of their personal experience. Let's see if there's another. Ah, there's a question directed towards Laisha. Uh, please define restriction, no, no restriction in reference to slide number eight, who can go there? Hi, um, slide number eight, who can go there? Oh, um, so related to people experiencing suicidality and um, related to homelessness and housing status, meaning that um, they don't have a policy in place, formal policy that says if you're feeling uh, or thinking about uh, killing yourself that you can't come or if you don't have a home then you can't come. That's, it refers to a formal restriction in a policy. Okay, thank you. And this will probably be the last question we can get to. Um, and it looks like there's a few more. So. Um, we'll take this one. Uh, what what about admission to the peer support home for those who pose a harm to self or others? Question we often get. Yeah, I would probably need that to be more specific because that's kind of framed in um, sort of medical legal language that so that necessarily describe someone's individual experience um, and I mean there's a risk for harm liability implications and 
anywhere really, but, you know, in hospitals and non peer run programs. Um, so, I mean, if there was like an example, I, yeah. I'm not really sure what to say. Um, it, this is Bevan. I mean, I think it, more generally, I, I agree with Leisha. It's hard to determine who, I mean, who is determining that, that risk um, is the key question. Um, but uh, one practice that's used at Second Story, and I think in a lot of respites, is um, when the first person first arrives at the, res at the respite, or even um, before they come to the respite, they just see the respite of something they may use in the future. Um, there's a, an interview that takes place between the members of the respite and the, and the guests, or potential guests, um, where they get to know the person, um, lay out some of the you know program guidelines, how things go with the program, um, talk to them about you know what it is, what kinds of support they're hoping to get out of the program, um, the circumstances that have, have led them to um, committing to use the program. And I think um, for, for many, um, that information is really critical um, for establishing those early relationships and also determining if the rest of it is the best place for a person to stay at. But it's really a mutual process. Um, that happens, uh, that's a give and take between the guests or potential guests and the, and the team members who are working with the rest of it. Um, and it needs to come to, um, through that mutual agreement, it's not an assessment, um, it's, it's, it's very different. Yeah, and just to follow up on that, um, I'm most familiar with the AFIA peer respite in Massachusetts because I, I live in Massachusetts. And um, I know the way that they do things is it's more about um, shared values and uh, like Bevan said, a, a discussion before the person comes in, um, you know, is this a good fit um, and, and are you able to um, live by the values of, of the house, uh, which include things like basic respect and uh, things like that. And so that is what's used so there is no formal assessment. I think that what that's what one of the things that really makes it a peer respite is there's there's no assessing. It's not medical, um, that kind of thing. It's if can you live with another group of people for a short time and with a set of values, and and um, it's worked really well. I think. Um, so with that, um, I think we're going to have to close. The webinar. I wanted to thank everybody for attending and thank the panelists for some great presentations. Again, this will be archived. If your question was not answered, you can contact um, the presenters directly, or you can contact me at oryx o r y x at power to you dot org. Um, and uh, hope to hope you'll join us for the next webinar. Thank you all.